Coming up on DTNS is Intel's Beast Canyon Nook, right for your gaming needs. Facebook's future is not as a social network, apparently. And the first patent awarded to an AI comes from South Africa. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 29th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from somewhere in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just sharing earthquake stories, falafel recommendations, all kinds of good stuff on Good Day Internet. If you want to become a member and get those conversations, do it right now at patreon.com slash DTNS. We'll wait. But while we do, we'll tell you a few tech things you should know. Google will ban sugar dating apps from the Android Play Store starting September 1st. If you're asking, what does that mean? These are apps the company deems to be promoting compensated sexual relationships. Google also has a new policy to delete developer accounts if they've remained inactive for a year, with exceptions made for accounts behind apps with over 1,000 installs or with recent in-app purchases. Google said in a video that it will notify developers of impending deletions 60, 30, and then seven days before they happen. Sugar dating, the world's oldest app. Huawei announced the P50 and P50 Pro smartphones both run Harmony OS uh, with the P50 and one version of the Pro using Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 SOC, while another version of the Pro uses Huawei's Kirin 9000. Both offer large OLED screens, 66-watt wired fast charging, IP68 water and dust resistance, with the Pro having a 120-hertz screen, 50-watt wireless charging, and an extra 40-megapixel monochrome sensor. So you get that wireless charging. Pro starts at 5,988 yuan. That'd be around $927 US. Available in China August 12th, while the P50 starts at 4,488 yuan, shipping in September. Bang & Olufsen announced the $399 BioPlay EQ, the company's first pair of active noise-canceling wireless earbuds available on August 19th. The buds support Qualcomm's aptX adaptive standard to optimize audio based on your location, RIP54 rated for dust and water resistance, and also support wireless Qi charging. A beta update to the Sony PS5 adds the ability to expand storage using the console's M.2 slot. Only PCIe Gen 4 solid state drives are supported though, and those must include a heat sink that fits within the drive slot. And you have to have a PS5. <laughs> OpenAI released a new programming language called Triton, designed for machine learning researchers and engineers unfamiliar with GPU programming. The Triton complier, uh, co compiler is built to make programming parallelism easier than NVIDIA's CUDA. Currently, only NVIDIA GPUs are supported, but Triton's GitHub page says that AMD GPU and CPU support is in development. All right. Facebook continued that trend of stellar tech company earning reports. Revenue is up 56%. Monthly active users up 7% to 2.9 billion. That's a little more than a third of the world. Though, 7%, a little slower growth than Facebook has experienced in the past. And like most tech companies, Facebook warned of a possible slowdown in the coming quarter. While Facebook indicated Apple's change to iOS will affect its ad sales more this quarter than it did in the last quarter, uh, a lot of the slowdown may also be the fact that it experienced some unprecedented high revenue growth in the past year, and it's just hard to duplicate that. Meanwhile, Facebook will continue to try to lure in video creators. Video now accounts for half the time spent on Facebook, and Instagram Reels is the largest contributor to engagement and growth in the company. So... Where are they headed next? They talked about that, that a little bit. Sunglasses in the metaverse, my friends, is the future of Facebook. On the earnings call, Mark Zuckerberg said, quote, the next product release will be the launch of our first smart glasses from Ray-Ban in partnership with Essilor Luxottica. The glasses have their iconic form factor and they let you do some pretty neat things. He did not define what those pretty neat things would be. However, previously, Facebook has said the glasses will not have an integrated display or be used for augmented reality in the first generation. So fancy smart headphones, maybe works with your phone. I don't know. In any case, it's the first step on Facebook's planned journey to the metaverse. Zuckerberg doubled down on the metaverse, by the way, saying Facebook's long term goal is to become a metaverse company, but it won't be cheap. 
Zuckerberg said, quote, it is going to require a very significant investment over many years. And then he looked in the eyes of every investor watching that call. <laughs> How will it make money, you may ask, if you're one of those investors? Well, perhaps already guessing the answer, uh, Zuckerberg said ads will probably be a meaningful part of the metaverse. We're shocked, Mark. Uh, Zuckerberg also said people will buy stuff uh, in the metaverse, but who can say? Everything's possible. It's the metaverse. Uh, Patrick, I saw you had your hand up. Yes. I just love the fact that they're partnered with Essilor Luxottica, which is the iframe company that is accused of creating a virtual monopoly in in glasses and thus the massive markups on frames based on the materials. And it's I, I just found it. You ironic. find that ironic that two companies accused of being monopolies would partner up together for crazy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing with the the. The AR glasses, I, I, I think we're, we're still waiting for that, you know, the killer hardware where finally people say, oh, okay, this is the, you know, everyday thing that people want, like a smartwatch. Uh, it has, it has been tried. It will continue to be tried, but I, I don't know what that product is. And so when you hear, ooh, Facebook's teaming up with Ray-Ban, and you know, they, you know, it's has all the money in the world and the company says, well, but it's not going to be an AR experience, at least not the first gen. Yeah. What? is it sure maybe there's some integrated uh earbuds but that is not i mean th i'm not saying it's not gonna work well but that's not cool it's yeah, just I'm, like i'm really? intrigued i'm intrigued because yeah. i don't believe facebook's just gonna put out some ray-bans with with earbuds stuck in the side right we've seen that before and that wouldn't From be good Bose enough so what is that twist Hip gonna companies. be yeah. What is that thing that's like, oh, they will have bone conduction and you'll be able to talk to them. So you'll be able to tell your smart assistant to do something oh, through the through the class. I, yeah, I don't know. I also, I mean, this kind of stuff, I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because we don't exactly know yeah, what right. the product's going to be. But this kind of stuff is right now, if I wear sunglasses and I wear, you know, my, my jaw bros, those are my earbuds that I use, I don't want them to be connected to each other. I like to use them in conjunction with each other, but I don't want to need to use them together. So a lot of that stuff is like, are you building a product just to say that you build it? Or is this something that's actually going to help me the next time I get in my car and it's really sunny outside? Yeah, although although they're Ray-Bans, they're not necessarily sunglasses. We keep saying sunglasses because we associate Ray-Bans with sunglasses. Ray-Bans al also makes regular frames. That's so true. they wouldn't have to be sunglasses, but the point remains, what, what are they? What, what are they gonna do? They're a recording device in your glasses that's going to nag you if you aren't currently logged into Facebook anytime you try to look at something. The, the, it's the, the, myth, product. the myth that Instagram is listening will finally become true with the Ray-Ban Facebook glasses. <laughs> Who knows? Well, speaking of looking toward the future, which is kind of already here, at least in this sense, Protocol took a look at how the Electronic Transactions Association, or ETA, is approaching central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs. The ETA represents all of the big financial companies, Visa, Wells Fargo, Google, <laughs> etc. Recently, we mentioned that the U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell designated a digital dollar as a high-priority project, something that they care about. It's going to, you know, somebody's going to make it eventually. The banks, and therefore the ETA, want to help guide how that digital dollar would be issued, how transactions would work, and most importantly, how it would affect them. Mm. And hopefully as positively mm. as possible. Protocol interviewed the CEO of the ETA, Jody Kelly, who acknowledged that governments like digital currencies as a way to reach low and moderate income Americans and also solve cross-border challenges, among other things. But... There are risks to the banks if people keep money in a digital dollar system instead of a bank. That would reduce the amount of loans that banks could offer, for example, making credit harder to get. On the other hand, banks like, like that it could simplify cross-border transactions and make interoperability easier, though the CBDCs of multiple countries need to interoperate to realize those advantages. <clears throat> there's quite a there's quite an infrastructure that needs to be built in order for this to work correctly. Digital currencies are coming. We know that they're coming. The Bahamas already has one, the sand dollar. China's digital yuan is in wide testing and almost every other government is in development of some kind of digital currency. The tone of the protocol interviews that banks know it's coming and are warning of the complexity of making it work because they're banks yeah. and they want it to work for them. Now, 
I know that in this day and age, saying anything that isn't critical of banks will make you immediately unpopular with everyone except the bankers. Uh, but I think they do have a, a, a legitimate know. point that if deposits dry up in banks, that could be really bad for all of us uh, because the banking system is so pervasive and fluid credit is the grease that makes the economy go. So we shouldn't be too quick to say, like, F the banks. Uh, on, on the other hand, it does the tone of this article to me struck me as uh, not just we want to make sure that that we implement this in a way that doesn't cause more harm than good, but also we want to implement this in a way that we're mostly in control of it. Please. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was I, I, I don't see why they couldn't participate in a digital currency. I also don't entirely understand why we need a digital currency, given how digital our current non-digital currency is. Well, um, here's here's the let, let, we've talked about that previously on the show, but let me address okay. that real fast. Uh, they can't participate in a digital currency because you don't need a bank to hold the deposit. That's what makes it great for the unbanked. Right. You would just have the blockchain record of your deposit and no Which bank. Worked necessary, out so well right? for so many people. It, there's a way to implement it that works out very well, and it okay. really can help help the unbanked. Okay. It's all about who's in control of it that's the question, and that's a whole other side conversation. But the technology can work very well, and there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, it could make transactions super fast. It could make it easier for people okay. to have digital currency that then they could use to pay, et cetera, et cetera. So. Okay. I you have schooled. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just wondering it. if there's anything else from that. I'm just, I don't I, know. I, 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 well, I mean, I do have thoughts, but uh, I think that, yeah, the digital currencies coming is, I think it's happening. The, uh, you know, the big banks, you know, and I'm using air quotes here, right? Um, it's just a great example for institutional, f you know, financial leaders to be like, whoa, 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 this is happening really fast. Let's make sure this is right for us Are because if not, we all suffer. Where's the upgraded well, charges? Yeah. Where are the but monthly fees? All of those things. But as Tom mentioned, yeah, I mean, if the if if the whole uh, institutional system crumbles too quickly, that isn't necessarily good for right. anybody. Even you know, people who want to you know let let's let's embrace our new uh, um, uh, you know uh, digital currency overlords kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. It is. It's it's a it's 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 a de delicate situation. I do roll my eyes a little bit at the bank part of it, but I I under I I also use a bank. You know, it's it's something that I need right now. I don't yeah, want my do. situation <laughs> to go away either. Yeah, uh, B Master Eighty is saying, how about making it easier for people to get a bank account instead? Honestly, that's the idea. the The positive idea of a digital currency is that it would make it easier to get a bank account because it would be the advantages of a bank account without having to involve a bank without having to go and and sign up and show credit history and be denied and all of that, uh, it would it would make it super easy. It would be the same as making it easier to get a bank account, making it easier to access money. Some Amazon's Kindle readers uh, come with a built-in data connection, meaning you can buy and download books wherever you are, but that only lasts as long as the system providing the connectivity does. 2G connections went away years ago, and alas, the bell is now being rung for 3G starting in December. Amazon Kindles won't be able to connect by 3G, meaning that older Kindles without Wi-Fi are left without a connection, and 3G-only Kindles will only have their Wi-Fi connections. Devices with Wi-Fi will still be able to access the Kindle store, of course, over Wi-Fi, and Kindles with 4G won't be affected at all. Amazon's offering some trade-ins, though. If you're going to be in this boat, you've got till December to figure it out. The first and second gen Kindles didn't even have Wi-Fi, so they get the most generous options. First gen owners can get a free Kindle Oasis. First, second DX and second gen Kindle keyboard, third gen owners. So the first and second DX, second gen and Kindle keyboard, third gen owners can get $75 off a of Paperwhite or Oasis and $25 in ebook credits. And the rest of the affected batch have Wi-Fi, but Amazon is still offering $50 off a of paper white or an Oasis and $15 in ebook credits to those owners. Uh, when you bought this, it was clear like, hey, this connection won't last forever. Uh, but an e-reader does last a long time. And, and a lot of these e-readers are probably still in use and outlasting their connections. You also get used to it. Even if, even if you, you know, that you were told, well, 
don't get too used to this. It won't last forever. <laughs> I mean, if you were, you're using a you know 2G Kindle, right? You, you've probably been pretty used to it by now. Uh, kind of a bummer, but I guess the company is offering at least some incentives so that the more upset people we say, well, grumble, grumble, I can get a few books this way. Yeah, it does feel like in the past, Amazon or other companies would have been like, sorry, that's just the way it goes. You know, too bad. You can still use it for the books you got. Uh, easier to say to the Wi-Fi people than the people that have no connectivity uh, whatsoever, right. of course. But you right. can still use USB, I guess, would be what they're saying. But Amazon's not doing that. They're saying, no, we'll, we'll either replace it, you know, for the most affected or, or we'll give you a discount on a new one. Um, I don't know about y'all. I, I feel like this is all right. This is probably yeah. a decent response. Yeah. It, compared to some of the other responses, which would be like, eh, if you don't like it, go to Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Where's Barnes and Noble, Patrick? I don't know where I, Barnes and Noble is. Oh, well, we four ran miles that way. I yeah, think we ran most of them out of business. Though. Sorry. Yeah. No, they're not <laughs> yeah. doing that. Thankfully. Hell, All right. Still lost. We, we are very thankful for Dan Campos, uh, who, if you speak Spanish, you've got to subscribe to NTX. Dan has a little bit of knowledge for us here. Did you know that 97% of people type words to Google used to see if they spell it right? Another way you can be sure you get the right information is by listening to Noticias de Tecnología Express. Disponible todos los viernes en español. All right, folks, multiple outlets have their reviews out for the Intel NUC 11 Extreme, a.k.a. Beast Canyon. Uh, NUC stands for Next Unit Computing, and Extreme stands for Does a Lot, but Probably Best for Gaming. Uh, the, the, end use, the Next Unit Computing is official, the other's my own. The idea with NUC is you get a CPU and a motherboard in a modular compute element card that plugs into a case. Uh, theoretically, you'd be able to swap that out easily. In reality, that hasn't always worked so well yet, maybe someday, uh, but it's also a lot easier to build. Uh, in other words, you bring the RAM storage in the GPU. Beast Canyon provides an 11th gen Intel CPU and supports full-size GPUs now. It's also larger than previous NUCs at eight liters in volume. It's still smaller than a mid-tower, but it's not the tiny little cube the NUC used to be. If you want full-size GPU support, though, it's this or the cheaper but more complex to build mini ITX PC cases. Beast Canyon has mesh air vents that let you see the GPU you've put inside it, an LED skull that lights up when you turn it on, because that's fun, and most importantly includes a 650-watt, 80-plus gold power supply. So yeah, you can put it in RTX 3000 series or most of the AMD 6000 series in it, up to 350 watts TDP. And Gadget found that the 6800 XT was one that was too large due to the heat sink, but that the RX 6800 and the RTX 3080s both fit fine. And Gadget's PC Mark 10 benchmarks showed it outpacing every Windows PC they've seen this year, and only the M1 iMac beat it in single-core performance. Beast Canyon can transcode a 4K video clip to 1080p in 41 seconds. The Core i7 and i9 uh, models of Beast Canyon are expected to sell between $1,150 and $1,350. That's $1,150, not $11.50. Uh, you can buy compute elements separately, they technically still work in the NUC 9 Extreme, though not all the features, like sound and PCIe 4. Uh, those cost you $780 and $980. But PC, do you want to build it? Do you want to get a NUC? Do you want to go with a mini ITX case? Patrick, what should we do? Okay, um, this is a really interesting product because... It's, it seems to be mostly to be a response to the Ghost Canyon Nook from last year, which was essentially a, a very small gaming PC, except that it only fit eight inch uh, uh, GPUs inside of it or not full length. Now, admittedly, there's a couple high end GPUs that won't fit in this, but anything 12 inches or under that's not triple slots, which means pretty much anything up to a 3080 Ti should fit in this. That's a big deal. It also really is huge because most people think of Nooks, you know, it's like four bars of butter. It's a fairly small box. It fits in your hands. And at eight liters, this thing is huge. It's three liters bigger than the Ghost Canyon one from last year. Um, you know, I, I think there's some really interesting question marks around the compute element cartridges because the idea is interesting. There's the case, it opens up, there's a back plane, 
there's a couple of, of, of big like PCI express looking slots, you know, where, and one of them is for this thing that looks like a GPU, but it's actually the compute element cartridge, which has a miniaturized motherboard, a CPU, and then you fit memory and storage inside of it. And I think the kind of secret thing about this is these are incredibly powerful machines and there's a ton of connectivity. You can fit uh, three M.2 2280s inside the compute module. There's a fourth 110 millimeter M.2 slot in the base of the case. You can fit up to 64 gigabytes of DDR4 inside of this so these could be really really useful for people who who you know want a lot of computing power but don't necessarily want a big pc case um you know it's an interesting idea you know you're basically looking at a 350 dollars or 500 dollars cpu a motherboard case fans a 650 watt 80 plus gold power supply unit and then you have to buy uh, you know, GPUs and memory and SSDs yourself and bring them into that. Um, you know, that's kind of crazy, right? There's eight full-size USB 3.1 uh, ports on it. There's additional headers in the case. There's two Thunderbolt 4 ports, uh, 2.5 gigabit per second Ethernet, HDMI 2.0. It's a really, really powerful machine. It's a beast. It have the yeah, it would be nice if it had USB ports on the front. Um, but uh, other than that, it seems to have just about everything you want. Oh, uh, Wi-Fi 6E is built in, Bluetooth 5.2. It's super bleeding edge. Um, the really, you know, the, the $64,000 question is, A, do you care about whether or not in a few years or a couple of years you can swap in another compute element cartridge? And I, I thought it was funny because one of the things I think Intel said in response to one of the reviews is, is you mentioned it, right? It, well, it should fit into Ghost Lake, but we're really not. You, you can plug one in and, and, and deal with what happens next. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> It, it'll you know. fit after that. <laughs> you, you know, know our hands are tied. Yeah. 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 Good luck with to that. Me, to me, tell me if this is fair. It strikes me as you want the options that you get when you build it yourself, but yeah. you want it to be easier and and have have uh, and have a, a faster time putting it all together. And you'll give up a little bit of flexibility for that. Well, in some ways, you're going to give up a lot of flexibility, right? I think part of the performance is the fact that they have this very tightly integrated motherboard and processor package. Um, you know, which is great, which is kind of an Intel thing. Um, I, I think the downside is that, you know, if you, you do want to upgrade this thing in the future and Intel doesn't offer a new compute module, you're basically taking all of your parts out of this and buying another motherboard and a case to put those into. So, right. you know, the, the, we've, there's been this theory over the years that you'll be able to drop in a new power, you know, it, it, it it seems like nobody ever wants to still make another CPU module thingy for you by the time you actually want to upgrade one. Um, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest challenge. The it's other almost thing there. is it's almost these there. are, these are a little spendy, you know what I mean? Like there's a trade off and I've, I've built a bunch of mini ITX cases. So I love the fact that it fits a full size uh, GPU because the only thing harder to find than a 3000 or 2000 series GPU is a sub eight inch uh, 3000 or, or 2000 or, or for that matter, 1080 or, or 1650. They're just, they're just not yeah. as popular as the, as the big cards. Um, you know, uh, and they're, they're spendy. Um, you know, I, I would suggest if you can, if you want to build one of these, I would buy the Intel Nook module myself, then I would probably buy the memory and the SSDs separately. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the other thing that was, was striking me is cause we we're talking in pre-show and, and you were, uh, uh, you know, you were talking about, well, you know, maybe you get a better deal on a GPU. And I think maybe you can buy a GPU, but it was crazy. Uh, an RTX 3070 from Intel's partner on this, which is simply Nook, they're going to charge you $2,000 for an RTX 3070, $800 for an RTX 3080. Yeah. And I started nosing around and like the cheapest 37, 3070 equipped machine I could find on Dell.com was about $2,400. So... You know, if, if there may be shortcuts to getting a GPU in a pre-built rig, I don't think this would be the best kind of platform. Definitely for not it. the uh, cost-effective way to do it. For yeah, sure. yeah, that's that's a two thousand dollars for a thirty seventy <laughs> is is kind of spendy, <laughs> even by today's standards of, of yeah, yeah. Uh, spending too much for GPUs. I, know I like that, it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna say I like it. I mean, I also love small, compact, powerful machines. Um, and this, you know, I love the fact that they managed to stuff a 650 watt power supply into a, a box this small, probably, you know, mostly because they have their compute module instead of a traditional motherboard inside of yeah. there. It seems like so, the uh, advantage is the design. I know the knee jerk reaction yeah. is like, why, why not just build it yourself? Why, why compromise? Uh, so if you are someone who's like, no, the beast Canyon, that's for me. This, this is why, uh, send us an email. Uh, we'd love to, to hear the explanation feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. 
Well, last week, South Africa granted Stephen Thayer, the chief executive of St. Charles, Missouri company Imagination Engines, a patent for interlocking food containers that could help robots to grasp and then stack. That's interesting if you're really into ro what robots can do and, and are becoming better at. But it's even more interesting when you read that the patent lists the creator of the invention as Davis an artificial intelligence algorithm. Davis stands for Device for the Autonomous Bootstrapping of Unified Sentience. Mm. Davis was made by Imagination Engines. The patent was one of many filed with the help uh, from University of Surrey law professor Ryan Abbott. Abbott's team has filed patents that list an AI as the inventor in 12 countries since 2018. And South Africa is the first to approve one. The European Patent Office, the UK Intellectual Property Office, the, and the US Patent and Trademark Office have all previously rejected Abbott's applications on the grounds that only humans can be inventors, not AI, only the humans behind the AI. These countries argue that the creator of the AI algorithm should be listed as the inventor. But Abbott argues that the programmer of an AI may not be the one that uses the algorithm to output an invention later on, and the programmer should not be liable for every use that an algorithm is put to, nor should users of algorithms necessarily have to give patent royalties to the programmer. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword there. Uh, op opinions are split because South Africa's patent office has a reputation for not having, shall we say, as thorough of an examination process as some others. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so opinions are split about how much of a precedent this will end up being for other patent offices, but it's a precedent nonetheless. Uh, and it certainly is sparking that conversation, Sarah, of who should get the credit, because if yeah. I if I created the algorithm that creates an awesome thing, I'm going to want to cut, even though I didn't do anything. But if I created the algorithm and it does something bad, I want no responsibility because I didn't do it. <laughs> so uh, I actually like the way South Africa did it here, which is there's an applicant that's a human that holds the patent, but the creator on the patent is listed as the algorithm. I just think this feels like one of those moments in an Isaac Asimov story you know, where they're trying to establish the rights of an AI. And, yeah. and this this whole movement seems like, you know, I mean, on one hand, think of it as me, they, like the resident cynic is going like, this actually sounds like they're trying to fight for the rights of AI. And of course, this was your turn to be like, you know, I want the money if it's good. And I want to be able to blame <laughs> the AI. If it's, we just sell hammers here, which has kind of been a theme yeah. this month. Right, um, but it, it's like it's not it's not the same as if I designed a hammer and sold the hammer and then I'm responsible for what you used it for. It's like I designed a thing that prints yeah. tools. Well, and also <laughs> and it's like you you, you could argue, oh, but you could use the hammer for all sorts of things, and then that would be a different invention, right? Yeah, but the hammer didn't change. The hammer is right. still the hammer. You know what you do with the hammer is sure there you yeah <laughs> do something nice. But but when it comes to AI, it's like, yeah, the person who says, I took that and I made this thing. I trained the original it. like programmer, you could train the hammer to do its things on its own. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thank you, original programmer, but you're not really working with me anymore. And, you know, you don't get to take credit for this cool thing that I made. I, you know what? The, the hammer... Th uh, is probably fraught with peril and I should give up the, the, the metaphor, but let me, let me just push it a little too far. Uh, it would be like if you built something with the hammer and they were like, Nope, the person who made the hammer gets the patent. You, you just built it with the hammer, right? Mm -hmm. We don't do that that's because the, the person with model. the hammer is a human, but that's essentially what's going on when the AI spits out a result that you yeah. trained it on. Can you imagine that is a great building. Give me money. I made that hammer. <laughs> I made your hammer. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I like figured out ways to make your hammer work well for me, and that's why I built this beautiful mansion. It's like the app stores. <laughs> it... <laughs> Man, oh, there's a rabbit hole. Right? Yeah. Away, All right, let's away. let's uh, take a look at the mailbag. Uh, so Tony wrote in. Uh, Tony works in IT and wrote in with some good tips on data backups in response to uh, Tom's latest "Know a Little More." Tony says, "I agree. Three, two, one's the way to go. Three copies of your data, two backups, one offsite. With the offsite backup being either the cloud or at a trusted friend or relative's house, preferably in another." He says county, but I think he meant country. One thing that bears mentioning, says Tony, I don't think is mentioned enough, is not so much where to backup, but what to backup. When I explain to my customers, I break that down into three tiers. Number one, irreplaceable files, photos, documents, podcast shows, stuff that 
you created and cannot be replaced. Number two, applications. And over, often overlooked what this would be, it, uh, this would include license keys, URLs to software downloads, CDs, ancient history, I know says Tony, but you might have them. I often suggest that the customer use a text file of some sort to store these license keys and the like. Passwords should be also documented somewhere, but obviously not in a plain text file anywhere. While these apps can be replaced, it would be costly to repurchase them. And number three, everything backups. This would be using software like Acronis, for example. Yeah, this is great. Uh, thank you, Tony, for for not only uh, uh, backing me up, <laughs> so to speak, uh, but but also uh, extending that conversation. In fact, I've I've talked to Tony. We're going to record and know a little more about how to figure out what should go in your backups, uh, which which files should go. So look for that coming this this fall, uh, once we've got that recorded. Thanks, Tony, for this. Is good stuff. Thanks, Tony. Uh, also, uh, thanks to everybody who sends us great feedback, just like Tony did. Questions, comments, pictures of your cats. All of that stuff can be sent to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thank you in advance. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Tony Glass, Philip Less, and Daniel Dorado. Guess what? We have two new bosses yes. to thank. Yes, we do. Gavin C. and Skip Berker. Both just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Gavin. And thank you, Skip. Yeah! So, when we get to the end of a month, we always want to have at least one more patron than we had the, the month before. And so when we get new patrons like this, it helps us get to that point. We've only got a couple days left. We're down six on the month. So if one of you happens to be six people, you can easily fix that by just becoming our patron or six of you could become a new patron. What whatever's yeah. easiest. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a six person and one, listen, the choice is I mean, pretty clear. Be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But uh but yes, but thank you patrons. Uh we really appreciate it. Can't wait to see who we can thank tomorrow. Also thanks to Patrick Norton for being with us today. Patrick Norton, such a pleasure as always. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. As of this week, uh, just go to avxl.com or search for AVXL, the home theater and audio podcast on your favorite podcatcher. Beautiful. Well, we are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC on this show. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com. Join us if you can live. We'll also be back with Patrick Norton and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>